This is John Callahan. Mm -hmm. Is the name Big Bang a misnomer? From what I recall, we don't actually have any evidence the Big Bang started with an explosion like a supernova or a black hole merger. Yeah, so first of all, the Big Bang was a name given to this idea that the universe started in this one primordial explosion. It was given pejoratively to this idea by proponents of what at the time was known as the steady state mm -hmm. theory hypothesis mm -hmm. of the universe. One where the universe always was and always will be, even though it's expanding, it's always been expanding. And matter is spontaneously created in the vacuum to fill in for where space is getting thinner. Okay. So that you'd always see a universe that looked about the same. This is called the steady state hypothesis. You could f get that out of Einstein's equations of gravity. That was allowed. Mm -hmm. But another solution was one where we're either collapsing or where we're expanding. All three solutions were allowed. The one with the Big Bang itself, uh, they was e it was an equal competitor to the steady state theory for decades until we finally got some evidence to support the Big Bang. And that was the famous micro cosmic microwave background. This is a leftover signal, signature, from an explosion that started in one hot primeval fireball. 13.8 billion years ago. Thank you, sir. Okay. You don't need me for this. No. That's, that was the only thing I remember. Showing a 13.85. You, you're showing off now. <laughs> no, no. I you're showing right, off. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. So so it was it was given as a as a, as a funny pejorative name, but it stuck and and right. if it fits, it fits. Mm. Now, it's not clear how much noise it would have made because just the expansion of space itself is not, you know, that's not associated with noise. Mm -hmm. And space is vacuum anyway, and mm -hmm. noise doesn't propagate. So if you don't want to call it the Big Bang, because it was probably made no noise. Mm. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you think you'd fix that by now. <laughs> no, you call it uh, the, the, how about the main event? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ready to blow up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the the big event, but you know, yeah, the main event. Is the well, main you've event. talked about laws and theories, and what used to be called. You remember laws that? Thank theory. you for that's a right? that's a subtle point. In, you, in the old days, mm -hmm. we'd come up with an understanding of the universe. A new law has been discovered. That's a very exciting time in science when that happens. And then you learn later on that with better instruments and more tools and deeper thinkers that what you came up with as a law was a smaller subset of a larger understanding. So you don't really, you shouldn't call it a law. Right. It's, it's a, but it works. Right. So we just use the word theory for everything that works now. Right. Well, and, if you, and if you just have an idea that hasn't been tested, we call it hypothesis, Paul's hypothesis. Right, well, okay. there's a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul's BS hypothesis. Well, you know, but there's something Bologna you said. Sandwich, that, hypothesis, <laughs> hypothesis, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, there's something you said in this context. You said, uh, this is a quote of yours, what happened in the 20th century is that we came to learn that whatever we determined to be true about the universe may only be a subtext of a larger truth. Yeah, that's right. Not that it would later shown to be wrong. Right. So it's not like science goes from one truth to another truth, discarding previous truths. Right. Not the physical sciences, at least. Um, not since the 1600s have we been in that situation. Right. Before the 1600s, that's, that's about when we... Uh, the methods and tools and practices of what we now call modern science were forged. Mm -hmm. Galileo, Francis Bacon, folks said, you know, if you have an idea about how the world works, you should test it. <laughs> it I don't care how it looks. Yeah. I don't care what your senses right. tell you. Right. Come up with an experiment that goes right. a little beyond your senses or extends your senses. Right. Galileo had a telescope. Uh, Liu and Hook had a microscope. Mm -hmm. You start seeing directions that were previously inaccessible to your sensory system. Right. Your eyes your your sense of touch, taste, smell. And so the universe comes to you now outside of your the experience of your senses. Right. And the experiment then becomes the measure of what is true, not whether it makes sense. And one of my recent books, the 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 front piece, the I mean the the, what, the epigraph, epigram, a gram or epigraph. I wish we get what they are called. Uh, uh, if I, you don't know, I'm not gonna know. <laughs> it's, I just said I just lead I just I just baptize people into this by saying <laughs> the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. Yeah. But it's, it, it's, but we're always in a state of subtext then in some way. Possibly. Yeah. There's some things we might know completely. Right. But uh, let it be open enough to say, this is a subset of a larger understanding. Newton's laws of motion and gravity worked. Right. Did he experience anything 
faster than a running horse well, that's, or, the, you, you, or the gravity of the earth. Right. And so it worked. Right. In fact, it got us to the moon and back. Right. But then we have particle accelerators and we got move yeah. close to the speed of light. And we say, you know, Newton's laws are these weird things so happening. So your knowledge is limited by what you can do at that time in the 20s, in the 80s. Correct. The and, and, the, and Einstein came up with his laws, his theories of, right. of, mo of motion and gravity. And we learned that it's a deeper understanding of reality that still has limits. Right. His, you know where Einstein's theories leave, leave us high and dry? At the singularity of the black hole. And at the singularity of the Big Bang itself, yes. it, 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 it's like dividing by zero. You remember you're not supposed to do that in math class, oh, right? Right. right yeah. Okay. So there's a there's a poster that said probably a T-shirt by now that said uh, a black hole, the center of a black hole. It's where God is dividing by zero, right? Okay. <laughs> so I thought that was cute. So so singularities are now the, a frontier of string theorists mm -hmm. and others who are trying to take it to the next level. Got it. Yeah. Just one other thing on this. Hawking said the boundary condition of the universe is that it has no boundary. Is that sort of what you're That's a, a to way here? to think about it. I think that's a it's it's a it's an organizational thought right. for you. Okay? You can say what is uh, Here you go. Ready? Uh holding flat earthers aside, mm -hmm. let's ass I assume you agree that earth is spherical. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So, so if I say to you uh, start walking and call me when you get to the edge of the earth. You'll say, I'm not going to do that because earth has no edge. Right. Meanwhile, you can walk forever and never get to an edge. Right. So what are the boundary conditions of the earth? Is there an edge? No. Right. There is no edge. Right. So, so, so you can have things that have no boundaries. They're real. The if, surface of the earth is one of so them. So if you can have that on earth... Uh, now you, you go to higher dimensions can you, can you, and you can just go to whole other it? places with that right. and imagine an entire universe that has no edge right. and no boundary. You can have no boundary in time. We live forever as a universe. There's no boundary at the other end of time. I got to tell you, I love you. Your job's annoying because there's never an answer at the end of it. No, we got some. No, no, no. I take you to places where we don't have answers because that's where things are coolest. Yeah. But there's plenty of stuff we have answers to. No, I know. Yeah. I, the, the age <laughs> of the earth, where humans came from. I, I got this. Uh, okay. Yeah. To quote Dr. Tyson, he's quoting you, heavy elements are forged in the cubicles of dying stars. Uh, crucibles. Oh, crucibles of dying stars. Wait, did you misread that or I, did he misread it? I misread that. So what do we have you for? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you college educated? <laughs> Indeed I am. But I'm only here because I'm charming. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, to get protons to stick together, they need high heat and pressures. So why wasn't there enough pressure to create anything heavier than hydrogen and helium in whatever started the Big Bang. Ooh, ooh, snap! Yeah, this guy uh, has do done some thinking here. Uh, ooh. I like it. Ooh. Okay, so, good good one. So at the beginning of the universe, he mm -hmm. knows that the conditions were just right to not only forge matter out of energy, mm -hmm. this is where you get your protons that are the nuclei of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element. That's the one that was up in the corner of the periodic table. Exactly. The whole periodic table begins there. Yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah. One proton. The Hel first step. The first step. And uh, helium has two protons, and right. lithium has three protons, and and, and and it just goes on and on and on. Carbon has six protons. Everybody's got a unique number of protons, and that's the identity of the element. So here we start with hydrogen. We take protons, slam them together, we make helium. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, why don't we keep making other elements in the early universe? We do a little bit of lithium is made, mm. trace amounts. And that's because the universe at that time was a little depressing. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> we need a little lithium. They said, we need some, let's, let's make let's some of that. Let's make some lithium. Some of that, right. So watch what happens. While the universe under high temperatures could have been making heavier elements, it is also expanding, right. becoming less dense. Mm -hmm. And as your density drops, the likelihood of particles colliding goes right. down. Exactly. It's, it's the difference between living in New York City and living in rural Kansas. Your chances of having an accident go way down when you're in rural Kansas. Well, uh, uh, the chances of walking into someone by That's accident. That's what I mean. Okay. Right. Colliding. <laughs> a collision <laughs> accident. A collision of any kind right. in principle. But Thank yes. you. So, so, yes. And so while the universe is expanding... Matter is not only becoming less dense, it's also cooling. Mm. And so the speeds of these particles drop. Gotcha. And so, in fact, you can look at how much hydrogen and, and helium is in the universe, in parts of the universe that have not been altered, 
severely, and go back and deduce what those conditions must have been. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you can go back and derive these from first principles, and those two num those two calculations match up. Gotcha. And so that's why we have very high confidence in what was going on in the early universe. Nice. Yeah. And whereas in a star, you make your, hyd your hydrogen, you have your helium, right. and you just keep going up the chain, and you are hot, you are dense, the stuff doesn't get less dense down there, it gets even more right. dense, right. you're good. Good to go. See, so okay, man, that's great. Yeah, I said it gets more. It doesn't. It, it just it gets, just gets. It's it's there contained, whereas right. the universe is expanding and cooling. Right, that's the difference. Great question. That is a great question. Yeah. Way to go, James Brown. James Brown, give me another. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any ways we can create a virtual singularity where we can represent the beginning? Dylan is coming to us from Washington Township in New Jersey. So would we be able, is there enough information about, you know, uh, and of course the background radiation is always there and it's always happening, but the event itself the singularity itself, could we, do we have enough information to recreate a visual representation of that singularity? To some degree, I would, I would say a little bit after, you know, when the universe starts to expand, yeah. So we, so we can't get the birth, but we could maybe get but, the slap on the ass. The baby slap on the <laughs> ass we could get, but we couldn't get the actual, you know. Pretty much, like, you get that first cry out. You get the first yeah. cry, but not the actual you know, it's crowning like that. That I, 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 <laughs> I am totally, we, we, freaking, wow, I am totally freaking Carter out with my description of the it's birth a, of the universe. <laughs> well, we, we we don't know. Okay, why we don't know? We, we can sort of describe what what and back to a certain point. But uh, so that 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 very beginning uh, is is something that that we extrapolate our physics right. to the point of the the greatest pressure and temperatures that and then we test this in the largest you know atom smashers in the world you know like at CERN and, and so forth uh, to really kind of look at what those conditions are right um, There's but quite a um, bit of mystery when you try to go all the all way, the all way back, back. That that's right first tiny fraction of a second mm -hmm. right it's very hard to get information and so we're left with theory and theorists of course like to argue with one another <laughs> and then and <laughs> then fun. yeah and then looking at how the universe expands and and uh, that that we can track that to some degree okay um, and and that's uh, a visualization of that by Tom Abel and his uh, visualizer Ralph Kaler is is in dark universe if you come see that so Sweet. The evolution of essentially structure over time. The universe is expanding, but locally it's contracting because of gravity. And so you end up with this giant sort of web, this cosmic web, which we actually observe. I mean, you can, even in a small telescope, you can go out. I grew up in New Jersey, and you, you could look up in the constellation Virgo. And that's why it's called the Virgo Cluster. And mm -hmm. you see you see galaxies even even a small telescope so you're you're looking at a a local area of downtown which we are not and in the same way that we're sort of in the suburbs of the galaxy. It's probably a good thing. It's a good place to raise the kids. About why we're so uptight here on Earth because we're living in the suburb of the galaxy. Well, it's a little more stable than the raucous ride in the middle of it. Maybe <laughs> someday when we grow up, we can go downtown. Downtown, right? <laughs> the center of the galaxy. Exactly. The really good radiation. But not by yourself, no. and not unaccompanied, young man. And I mean that. <laughs>